used for Bangalore. We like to also thank Mr. Hughes, right, for the, the most welcome he gave us on his country in Angola. We received our uh, member of our delegation that we came to Angola on the 22nd of uh, October 2013, the grassroots movement in Angola. For those of you who didn't know about it, we, was, we went to Angola to meet uh, the, the leader of Angola concerning uh, our ID card problem. Okay, so our ID card is mean in reinforcing the historical ties between the people of Angola and St. Martin. It also asked to talk about the importance, that's what we asked him to talk about, the importance of the ID card as a means of recognizing the St. Martins in order for them to be benefit generally in all islands in the, in the Caribbean because Mr. Hughes also goes to a lot of these Caribbean countries, those overseas, uh, British countries, and we think that he would do a great job for St. Martin in the fight because Mr. Hughes is a great leader in his country. And with us, we don't have the same type of leadership in St. Martin. The follow type of trend, on which I would like to say that they uh, stand up for this one. Uh, Mr. Hughes, if you, some of you that placed with Angola, which I'm one of them, that placed Angola, I know XC told me to play with Angola very often, and I, when I drive on the road sometimes, I hear a lot of videos that be playing with Angola. I myself gone more strong on with Angola right now since I, I have three FM stations. I play 101 and I play one uh, 95, 92.5. So I, I gave it a 95.5. Uh, so I go now to, because I only have three bands for F, the FM. So I right now turn on right now to uh, another Angola station. So that's what happened. Okay. So like I said, our leaders here doesn't have that sense to try to follow a type of trend that is all about the master and nothing for themselves. Okay, and our, our great speaker that will be coming up next is Mr. Hubert Hughes. They recently have get rid of, listen to me very carefully, they in Angola have get rid of a governor that was sent from Harlem, from England, that was putting monkey wrench in their plan of moving forward. And the people of Angola behind, I say in front of the leader, behind the leader, Get rid of the governor. So on that note, I'd like to call the chief minister to introduce himself and to explain to people what he thinks and what is the future for St. Martin under which the grassroots movement has been taking the direction. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Let me say how much I appreciate being invited here on this very important gathering of the introduction of the identity card. Um, people in Angola say that all these islands, St. Bart, Statius, Sabre, St. Martin, form part of the Greater Anguilla. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my grandmother, obviously, was from French this all. And several of them settled in Angola, married and Williams. And you know, everybody in St. Martin has a link with Angola. Yes. And vice versa. So St. Martin is truly part of Angola. Mm -hmm. And we feel part of St. Martin. When I come to Angola, I feel as if I'm coming home. Now I've heard two great speeches for this, for this afternoon from two great St. Martins. And uh, these are the type of people who can be leaders in any part of the world because of the standards that they exhibit wherever they go. We have had the Jeffries in Angola on numerous occasions on important nationalistic debates. Um, you have this great Dr. James here who's made so much of a sacrifice as an extremely educated man to expose himself to the type of ridicule that people like him would get from the metropolitan powers. Um, but that is the sacrifice that made Africa free today. As, as you know, the whole African continent was colonized. 
mainly between Britain, France, Spain. And uh, at one time, other smaller states like um, Holland and even Denmark were involved in African colonization. These islands were fought for by the European, West European powers along the seaboard of the Atlantic from France, Spain, Holland, and in some instances some of the Scandinavian, Scandinavian countries did come to this region, um, Denmark owning the Virgin Islands and eventually America buying those islands back from, from Denmark. Sweden was supposed to be in St. Bart's and the French have taken over St. Bart's. Um, from, from the Swedes. But um, St. Justatius, which you know is a very small island, changed hands 32 times between the British, the French, the Dutch, and St. Justatius has two forts. It has a fort pointing down at St. Kitts, and it has a fort pointing over the harbor. So it just goes to show you how valuable these islands were to the European colonizers. Um, there was a time when Martinique was supposed to be exchanged by France for Canada because Martinique was producing the type of um, merchandise which could fetch a very good price in Europe, being a tropical country. So you know the importance of us to Europe. Unfortunately, we did not end up with one European colonizer. A small island of 37 square miles as St. Martin is, ended up with two metropolitan administrators. The French side, which you call the North, and the Dutch side, which you call the South, the South, have two different powers, obviously two different constitutional um, relationships. Even though today um, they have worked out their, their problems with us and give us all a similar passport called the European Union passport. Whether you're British, whether you're French or Dutch, we have the same passport. But you have to understand that we still don't have the same status with each other as you have in Europe. In the European Union you have um, freedom of movement, freedom of establishment, um, the consider themselves as one people. Because after the last world war, even Winston Churchill felt that it was unrealistic for black people to be able to come to England and enjoy the benefits of British citizenship when the Germans and the French and the Poles, who were also Caucasians, couldn't do it because of nationality. So they decided that they must have a grand state of Europe. And as you know, after the last World War, Europe itself was divided between East and West. And Russia and the Soviet Union held on to the East European countries, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, Hungary, Albania, Bulgaria, and so forth. Whereas in the West, um, the British, French, and Americans held on to parts of Germany. As you know, Germany was divided. We had East Germany and West Germany. And the city of Berlin itself, even though the city of Berlin stands in Eastern Germany, Berlin was divided in two. And what the Soviets did is run a wall to cut East Germany, East Berlin, from West Berlin. And you, if you have to escape, the West, you have to come with the Brandenburg Gate, which I actually visited several times when I went to the tourism functions, ITB, in Berlin. And I was there before the wall came down, and I went back after the wall came down. So the issue of, 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 of Germany had to be reunited for what is called nationalistic purposes. Now when those two countries decided to reunite, West Germany was extremely rich and financially powerful. East Germany was extremely poor. 
and the East German mark was of very low value. Uh, and yet, they were prepared to pay the price of uniting the two currencies into one. And for quite a few years, the West Germans were paying the price of that unity. But the fact is that they wanted a greater Germany and for Germany to re-dominate Europe once again, which it now does. Um, as far as we are concerned, we were fighting our separate battles with our separate colonizing powers. And for instance, in Africa, you find that mostly, most of the African states were shared between France and Britain. But the French always had a different approach to the colonies than the British. The French believed in assimilation. Assimilation could also work for extermination as far as the smaller state is concerned. Because that's what they use in, in, in Australia. The issue of assimilation was used in Australia when the Caucasian, the European, went to Australia and decided to assimilate the indigenous Aborigines who were the real Australian. It led to the extinction of the Aborigines, Aborigines population and to Australia being a powerful white state. So the question of assimilation by the French is a very clever one because what it does to St. Martin, you are assimilated because you are overseas department of France. By being assimilated, then you are outnumbered and outfinanced in every way. Because if you look at St. Martin today, as well as it was when we were children, you realize that St. Martin is metropolitan France. You can feel the French. Everybody in St. Martin could speak English, but everybody could not speak French. And uh, no effort was made to preserve that situation where St. Martin remained a French and English speaking territory. One of the things that we need to understand, if we are to, to preserve our status as a people, is that we have to have positive discrimination in favor of our people who settled here and kept this island together, these islands together. When there was the days of cows and horses, peas, pumpkin, potatoes, and the European was not prepared to do that because they couldn't take the rigors of the sun and so forth and the poverty which existed in those early days. But we are left there to wander aimlessly across these islands. And we kept them together. And the St. Martiners and Angolans had to go off to the Dominican Republic and elsewhere to earn a living and to come back and do something for St. Martin. If it was not for the love that the islanders have for these islands, then human habitation would have come to an end because the houses that were built back here were built for money on the outside of St. Martin in the early days. And you all know that um, as far as education was concerned, um, the French were never interested in educating the people in French St. Martin. A few, a few St. Martiners um, were able to send their children to St. Kitts. For instance, I was talking to a tackling chap the other day who worked with the American forces and he reminded me that he attended the same grammar school that I attended in St. Kitts. And then you have people on the Dutch side who also went to school abroad. But the Dutch colonization was different from the French in that they gave them certain advantages to be educated. And if you look at what the Dutch did in Aruba and Curacao, for instance, which was virtually um, desert islands, they tried to create an, an economy in each of them by encouraging, um, first of all, the oil industry. And later on, when oil failed, they, went to, they were able to go easily into the tourism industry. Because during the oil days, they were able to develop the infrastructure, the type of concomitant infrastructure that is necessary to attract tourism, like a proper airport, a proper road network, water distribution systems, electricity, and so forth. So when oil failed, it was quite easy for Aruba to switch over into a new industry called the tourism industry. 
Now, in the African continent, the whole issue was about being nationalistic. You have to be nationalistic. What type of nation do you want in St. Martin? The people of St. Martin, the indigenous Afrocentric people of St. Martin, were the vast majority when St. Martin was poor. You were the vast majority. Yeah. Unfortunately, your leaders could not truly identify themselves with you. One British political thinker says, your representatives should have common interests with these people, but on common ability. You have people here with great ability today, but they were outwitted by the mulatto in St. Martin. The mulattoes destroy Haiti, and the mulattoes also destroyed St. Martin. I remember some years ago, I met a very outstanding St. Martin lady, a Negro, has her own business and so on, and we had an argument about who you should have as your representatives in St. Martin. And she was very, very forceful in saying, we don't want Black St. Martins to represent us. We don't want Black St. Martins to represent us. And what she didn't understand is that the so-called white St. Martins she was talking about get into politics to protect what they had. Most of the times when you hear um, privileged people going into politics, the goal to protect their interests. And the so-called white samulatas who were dominating the political arena in St. Martin were protecting their land here. Because one of the greatest assets of any community is the ownership of land. And people in this part of the island sometimes have to struggle for a house lot. But if I am the political leader and I own the land, how will you ever get a house lot? Because I'm not going to allow my land to be redistributed to other people. So the whole question of nationalism has to do with land and land ownership. For instance, after the last World War, all those Africans who fought alongside Britons in that war went back to Africa and found a West African land bank. A West African land bank. And that idea was to prevent the sale of West African land to Europeans. Because of that, West Africa was able to fight and beat off the colonial authorities and get their independence much easier than the people in East Africa and the people in Southern Africa. Because in East Africa, the land was still owned by the whites. It was 1952 that Winston Churchill declared 65,000 acres of land in Kenya called the White Highlands. They carried the White Highlands. Only European farmers could farm in that area of the White Highlands. Okay? And throughout East Africa, whether it was Uganda, whether it was Kenya, or uh, Buganda, which is the kingdom of Uganda, Uganda, small kingdom, you find that the European powers and eventually the Asians went in and they owned all the business sector and so forth and so on. That's why General Amin did a very good job in actually chasing the Asians out. It sounds cool, but somebody had to have <coughs> the guts and the courage to give the Africans something. And that's what he did. He had chased those Asians. They were British passport holders, and they went on to Britain. Today, they own all the business in England. Because Asians have a culture of 6,000 years of business. We underestimate the Chinese, we underestimate the Arabs, and so forth. We underestimate the Indians. But if you look at their history, you realize they have a very ancient history. Of course, the British went all around the world trying to colonize the entire world. 
And at one time she boasted that the sun never sat on the British Empire. Britain invaded Russia several times. Britain invaded China. Britain dominated the whole of India. And they had a super governor called the Viceroy of, of India. And he was an emperor of India, so to speak. And what Britain did, use a strategy that the Romans did to develop their empire of divide and conquer. They divide the people just like you have in St. Martin. People being divided. We can't have the Jeffreys because they're black. But who's going to represent you? A white man? No. And when you talk like that, they say you're a racist. So you find your own people defeat you. Of course you have started this process. And you must. And you must intensify your activities. Because you have a long way to go. You have lost almost everything. As outlined by, by Ms. Jeffries in this afternoon, your guests now dominate, more or less. Your guests have become your bosses. If you, if you understand what happened in small island states like, 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 like St. Martin and Willow, in Liechtenstein, which is about the size of St. Martin, no European, although Liechtenstein is set between Austria and Switzerland, no Austrian, no Swiss, no European can buy property in Liechtenstein. <laughs> Only Lestinian, Lestinian citizen can own 